Um, if you guys don't know me, in the, probably the late 80s, I, yeah, but 1988, a big traveler. Anytime I had a spare dime and a spare day, I was in a backpack and out of here. And I had noticed the harsher the terrain, the more remote the locale, when a vehicle wasn't about what looks cool and it's about life or death, I was seeing FJ40s in every crevasse of this planet. And from that experience and towing plenty of uh, Land Rovers out of trouble in FJ40s, sorry, it's an appropriate audience, I can get a <laughs> Land Rover dig in there. Um, I realized that the, uh, the value, the engineering, the clarity in every last, no every bolt, like everything exists on the Land Cruisers for a reason. And like that, that clarity of purpose and the continuity and the design and the engineering just made a strong impression on me. Um, so when I got back, I live in Los Angeles, got back home, always been a classic car geek, hardcore. Before I had a driver's license, I was restoring cars and driving them. But uh, I wanted some for my dogs and surfing and camping and stuff. So I bought a horrible 74 FJ40 from like a corner Armenian car dealer lot in the valley that was just a bucket of fiberglass and duct tape. It was just a train wreck. But I loved it. And being the geek that I am, of course, it ran fine. Everything was fine. But I started taking it apart and geeking out on it. And, putting it back together again. And at that time, it was weird because, I mean, we're, a lot, we're anyone here into, crew, into FJ40s back in the 80s and that time frame? So we were weirdos, and like no one was restoring them like you would a 65 Mustang or whatever, like a more typical classic car. And it just made no sense to me. So as a guy who had already restored dozens of cars, it was only logical to take it apart and restore it and put it back together. And around that time, I was realizing I really had zero interest in my day job. And I was starting to try and think, what the heck am I going to do? I'm going to get out of this. So I was taking night classes at USC, and I was taking a business class. And the professor was super cool. So we went out after the class, and we got into this big debate about supply and demand. And my thinking, obviously, the teacher was telling us the typical supply and demand story, whereas my generational thinking, I was like, well, no, not anymore, because with this thing coming out called the intranet or whatever it is, and you know all these new abilities to communicate and reach people, like if you can control the supply, you can create the demand, and you can kind of flip that on its head. So they said I was an idiot, got into this heated debate, turned into a $1,000 bet. So I was given three months to drive a trackable market up 30 points. And I had some time, and I was eager for a road trip. So me and my old chocolate lab, Walter, hopped in my old FJ40, and we hit the road. And I bought every FJ40 worth a damn that I could find. I think I did the Pacific Northwest and then back down, went through Utah, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and then back up to LA. And I had a friend who was a trucker who had this decrepit old grasshopper style 18 wheeler. And I would literally just with like a paper map, you know, X spots of where I bought what and where things were. And then I wait a week and I call him and come back behind me and sweep up all the cruisers and take them home. And because of my restoration habits, I had a friend with a body shop, I had another friend with a mechanic shop that were brilliant craftsmen, but crap businessmen. So I was trying to help them with just the business side structure, but suddenly I had three 18-wheelers full of FJ40s coming to LA and no plan and no property in a one-car garage and already had the 10 cars clogging the streets in front of my house. And I bought my house when I was 17 and my neighbors were like in their 70s and already thought I was crazy. So there was no way they were going to let me put even one more car up there. So I started calling the, my two friends with the shop. Said, hey, listen, you know, I've been helping you guys out. I need somewhere to store these trucks. And I, and I try to just keep it simple, which I should 
try and remember now that I've created the complex craziness that we're doing, just buy the best ones I could find, forensically take them apart, detail them, service them, turn them back around, and put them back on the market. And it was amazing. Like, suddenly, a lot of people that really appreciated the FJ40s, maybe from their own childhood experience or travel or whatever, they never bought them because they were only seeing pretty trampy ones and didn't want to get into it. So just by cleaning them up and dialing them in a little bit, the market started realizing, oh, wait, those are cool, or I remember those, and started gobbling them up. So I was all excited. I won the bet. I went back to collect. They wouldn't pay me for it. I was like, oh, come on. They're like, it was a joke. I'm like, what do you mean it was a joke? I just spent... Anyway. <laughs> so my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, she wasn't in love with her career path either. She was in music management, which meant she was a overpaid babysitter, and I was an actor, which meant I was an overpaid baby, and we both became for, I had a stalker that got really, really, really bad. I was never famous. I was most like teeny bopper magazine, sitcom-y stuff, and I had a stalker trying to kill me. So between realizing creatively it wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it was going to be, and as it actually had been for a really great, it was a great experience. I, got to travel the world, and I was never good at being a kid, so even at eight, nine years old, if I had the drive and the professionalism and the focus to succeed in a project, I was an equal with these adults and had like this newfound family, and I lived in a small town on a farm in Maryland and then quickly transplanted to New York City, um, got a Broadway show, just went on a cattle call that I wasn't even supposed to be at, went with a friend who was auditioning. My parents gave him 40 bucks just to get me out of the house for the weekend and so I could see the big city. Uh, but I was bored and it was a cattle call, meaning anyone could try out. So I just copied what the other kids were doing and I got it. So my parents felt bad and thought, well, we got to let them have the opportunity. And they did some research, uh, pre-Broadway stuff. Usually it's a couple months. Shows rarely make it to Broadway. If they do, it's only for a couple weeks or months. Usually they flop. And it was just a magic carpet ride that then went on from 1977 to 89. Um, that show was Peter Pan. It ran for a year and a half. Then I got other Broadway shows from that, started doing radio, started doing TV, and fun experience. But at the end of the day, it wasn't like I was at the point in my career. I was supposed to have all this creative input and control. And the projects that I loved the most would, like, get canceled after one airing and the stuff that I hate is still on reruns and driving me crazy. I can't get rid of them. So we were on vacation in South Africa, uh, wrapped up a bottle of wine and without much intelligent forethought, swallowed analysis or anything, we decided we're young, we're not in debt, don't have kids, let's quit our jobs, let's do our own thing because my dad did a career path that he didn't love. He did it because it was what he was supposed to do, and it gave him a good life. But there was something missing like in his spirit, I think, of just being fulfilled by what he has to do every day. And when, you could argue we spend more time at work than we do with our families, at least in this culture. So if you're not happy doing what you do all day, you're going to be somewhat miserable human and it's going to leak into the rest of your life so we decided to give my hobby of restoring cars and my newfound realization that i could make money playing with the land cruisers i loved so we came home we both quit our jobs i had six fg40s and a 62 20 grand in a piggy bank and three credit cards and a wing and a prayer and a friend with a 1,200 square foot shop that basically was the size of this area. But it had all the permits that we needed. And he wanted to bail, so he let me have two months free rent, and then it was month to month. So I just took all the cruisers in my hoard, shoved them all in there, put a post-it note on the window, carried my old Motorola brick phone, and waited for it to ring. And I kept traveling and buying up cruisers, and immediately I realized we we're onto something because people really appreciated the FJ40s the way that we did. Now, not being the smartest guy on the planet, I immediately overcomplicated things and started taking them apart 
and doing full concourse, ridiculous, unjustified expense restorations to them. And then suddenly we started getting Toyota dealers calling and asking if we'd do a resto for their collection or for the showroom or Greg at Toyota Iceland, is that FJ40 I built still spinning in the lobby? I didn't see it? Oh, bummer. That was a fun one. So anyway, we just kind of just kept tap dancing. And then, well, once we realized we're restoring and we're selling them, no one knew where to service them. And most of the Toyota dealers would be like, no, 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 no. It's got a carburetor. Get away. Like none of the technicians had even been there long enough to deal with it. So then we're like, oh, crap. I guess we need a service department. So then we ended up with that. Then Toyota stocked less and less parts. I ended up with more inventory of the parts than the Toyota dealers did. The Toyota dealers started calling us when they needed parts. And I'm like, well, I guess we need a parts department. And it just kept spiraling. So we went, it was like this multi-tenant, 1,200 square foot unit. And we had this one. And then we blew through the wall and took over that one. And then that one. Then we had to go around that old dude to that one and then across the hallway to that one and then across the street to that building and it just kept organically snowballing and some of our early clients became our employees because they got so into their cruisers and were tinkering and playing with them and they also were inspired by wanting to do something they felt was more fulfilling than their real job so they bailed and joined the team and we just kind of kept hoping we didn't trip on that treadmill and just kept going and growing and going and growing and now I've owned I just did uh, I looked it up this week I've owned just under 2,000 Land Cruisers uh, which is pretty stupid and many of which I wish I had kept and cannot afford to get back fortunately Greg has bought some of the my all-time favorites that we've had now are, are part of this collection and nice to see them preserved and, and uh, somewhere safe um, and it's just been an amazing wild ride. And you know, when we started doing it, there was Mark's off road in Burbank. What? No chuckles. No one's dealt with Mark and beloved Marv rest his soul at Spectre. And Marv had no interest in getting into restoration. It's like, nope, I just want to travel and fill containers and go to Japan whenever I can and hop in my RV and go for buying. And I was like 17, 18, just driving him crazy, picking his brain. And Marvin Kay were incredibly kind and open and shared a lot of knowledge with me. And Kay and I remain friends to this day. And we all, of course, miss Marv and all the precedents he set in creating such a kind community. And when I opened up the company, I was afraid I was going to offend him. So the very first thing, I went and sat down with Marv and said, look, I want to start this company. I want to start restoring and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not in the business of selling parts. I don't want to step on your toes and get in your space. I'm really going to focus on the builds. And he kindly blessed us and supported us for the rest of his life. And uh, beyond his death, in fact, I've stayed out of selling parts predominantly out of respect to my original commitment to Marv. Also, I think selling parts is kind of boring, and I think I suck at it. I have a bad habit of like over-designing, over-engineering something to the point that then the price point of that part is so stupendous that I don't want people yelling at me, so I'll just engineer it to use in my own builds. But with TLC, first 40s only and dead stock. You want a V8? Piss off. Go away total Gestapo about it. We were very, very picky and very stock. But I did notice over the years, the culture was changing, where some people love the archaic nature and the carburetor and the drum brakes, three on the tree, and that's part of the fun. And I'm that guy too for short drives. But at the same time, a much bigger audience loved the design utility premise and value of the early cruisers, but had no attach and no relationship with the archaic mechanical. So as more and more perversions were coming out with the doodads and gizmos of modern automotive design, people were, I thought, starting to wane because of the driving nature of something that vintage. On the flip side, 
as more and more modern vehicles became something designed to last about a day longer than the lease or warranty cycle, and there was plastic everywhere, and that, that clarity and quality and purpose that our Akawa put into the original Land Cruisers went out the window. I mean, it's a story, I don't know if any of you ever heard, but Toyota was actually asked by Microsoft, and they were doing sort of a corporate insider reveal as consultants to Microsoft. And early on in that experience, Toyota actually went, wait a minute, so those laptops, when the battery dies, you retain over 80% of your customers, but less than 5% of them are buying a new battery. They're buying the new laptop. How do you guys do that? that that's interesting to us. So that was kind of the beginning of the, that's one of, to me, one of the monumental shifts in the focus of transportation design to no longer was it about building it the best it can be to last as long as possible. Now it was about the revenue model, the repeat consumer, propping up domestic manufacturing. And now in Japan, every year your vehicle's aged, your insurance goes up, your registration goes up, the inspections get stricter and more frequent because it's all about propping up the money and the more disposable stuff is, the quicker we're all just gonna go back and get something. Which I think is asinine from like, a, if we care about the planet and really think about longevity, it's a scary, scary uh, cultural mentality that's gonna make us all go the way of the dinosaurs if we don't get our act together and correct that trajectory. And this goes back before Toyota, before any, any of that. I mean, Edsel, the, the Edsel, which is one of the biggest automotive flops in history, the Edsel was the first vehicle designed by a focus group. So you'd think they would have learned that that doesn't work, but no, it became the standard in the industry. So anyway, it's been like this amazing journey, never planned. One introduction, one handshake, one connections led to another and we've just enjoyed the ride and been maniacal about since I was a bit of a tramp in my previous career and so has my wife. Like, okay, if, if we're going to start over again, let's be really clear why we're doing it and what we value and what's important to us and protect those tenants at all cost. So with TLC, we could have done many things that would have made us great wealth or different opportunities but it would have taken us away from that core. And same with uh, the Icon brand, um, that now it's in the same building, the same um, main leadership, but it's like having two religions in one church between Icon and TLC. So the project managers, the parts staff, the inventory, the technicians are dedicated to each tribe independently, but then electrical engineering, mechanical engineering team, fab, CNC, machine shop, and all that. We have, of course, share all those assets together. So we were just kind of putting right along with TLC. We were feeling pretty good. We were able, we had about 15 employees. Everyone had health care. We were all making a decent living, still able to travel. Then I had kids, so they weren't traveling for about a decade. But um, one day we get a phone call, and... Uh, my wife is not known for her customer skills, so we don't let her answer the phone much. Someone calls and uh, wants to speak to me, and she's the gatekeeper. She's like, well, what is this about, you know? Um, okay, hold, please. So she gets, we have run like Motorola radios in the shop, and she's like, there's some guy on line three who calls himself Mr. Toyota. All right, so I scamper back to my office to pick up the phone. Now, at this point, I didn't even know there was a Mr. Toyota. So it was like God calling the church. And, and I was completely floored, but trying to be cool. And he was being a little cagey. But basically what we got from the conversation is, this is ridiculous that you have this business. 
and it's a business like you're not a rich guy with a hobby this is like a you have customers that pay you to take old Toyotas apart and put them back to like could not get his head around it like yeah no it's it's a biz you know it's, it's okay well I'd like to come visit so three days later he shows up with this ridiculous entourage and I just kind of give him the dog and pony show and take him through the shop and explain everything and they could not get their head around that culturally we were celebrating old Toyotas because the Japanese culture exponentially compounded by Japanese corporate culture you never talk about your past success so Toyota's slogans over the years moving forward and all of that they mean it so they had a real hard time looking back and even though they internally did have great pride in their history they just couldn't figure it out but they were starting to want to come up with something to get that Jeep buyer they wanted to figure out why the FJ40 still had this amazing tribal audience globally which they didn't even realize by the way when they came to me I was like well it's not just us crazy Americans like Australia Mideast Philippines like there's cruiser cultures there's tribes everywhere like it's a thing and they literally guys they had no clue at all floored them unfortunately I'd like to well yes it's fair to say that they still in my opinion don't have a clue I don't know if anyone follows me on Instagram I got in a little bit of trouble a couple weeks ago because I guess I was the first to leak that they are planning on discontinuing the Land Cruiser in North America and then Toyota's marketing manager is an old friend calls me uh, that following Saturday morning is like dude you're killing us so they were just getting inundated with uh, not happy people and maybe it'll turn the boat but frankly I, I seriously doubt it Toyota actually reached out after my rant and said okay we hear you could we do something with you and take the last thousand units and do special editions with you I said, yes that's great let's go I said I well, what would you do I said okay first thing I do I want TMNA's marketing manager TMS people let's go over to Gibraltar let's go to the Mideast I want to show you guys some real land cruisers and let's go look at the current series with lockers even cable actuated lockers and vinyl interiors and rubber mats you can remove and drain plugs and you can hose it out and vinyl instead of high to the elusive naga and reconstituted leather and wood and all this stuff and it's like well, why have we done that well that's what the American consumer wanted said, no they didn't no that is what they want our focus group said oh geez, guys you and your focus groups so as the conversation goes I ended up doing a PowerPoint just saying because I know the idea of getting these guys hurting the cats to actually go with me on a trip and do a little look-see wasn't gonna fly so I reached out to a bunch of friends in the Toyota community and I had a little PowerPoint showing all these elements immediately one of the lead guys he's like yeah no we if we decontent the Land Cruiser the way the current Toyota system is designed for example if we want to pull out the refrigerated center console it'll cost more than if we don't if we wanted to add this I said oh, no 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 I'm getting into certification to stay all with certified compliant stuff but it's their own corporate infrastructure and what they call Toyota two show group the sort of inner trade compound that they end up over complicating it so I don't, I don't know I don't think we'll we'll be able to do it but after mr. Toyota left the shop they called back and they they explained that they they wanted to do this sort of FJ revisit and they asked if I'd build a prototype duh yeah of course I will and they're like do you have any ideas I'm like well funny you should ask because I've been traveling to Brazil already been there about four times literally annoying the Brazilian Toyota dealers and banging on doors at the Toyota 
uh, right in Sao Paulo, there used to be San Bernardo de Campo factory where they made the banderantes. Now the banderantes, think of, uh, think of a turtle that floated to the Galapagos and evolved for generations in that unique environment, responding to that environment. Now think of the Banderante as a 1958 FJ25 that got sent there and evolved uniquely to that market because they never exported, not only never exported a truck, they never even exported like a spark plug. And in like 2000, when I'm at a Toyota dealer in Brazil trying to buy parts, they don't even have a shipping department for the parts. And I'm killing, like, you could look back in the warehouse and look at like 74 and older 40 doors, NOS and wooden crates, like, duh, 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 like hundreds of them, like, uh, uh, like we can't get those. Uh, one piece drop down tailgates, bug catcher weather strip, like all the weird cruiser geeks, unobtainium stuff. It's just sitting there rotting and it was killing me. So had I had already been driving Toyota crazy on a lower level in Brazil for my own antics. So when Toyota asked what I would do with the FJ, I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We gotta go to Brazil, we gotta go to this factory, and I wanna bring in this body style, that wheelbase, and they just started making at that time the crew cab pickup, which I forget the right BJ, or whatever they called it, which the tan one up front in the museum, we imported that body assembly, but they were building those for the military there, and it f absolutely floored me. So for kind of my own, because I wanted to import all those parts anyway, but it, it made sense for the Toyota program. So they said, yeah, let's do that, but one thing we're gonna tell you, we want it based on a taco. It's gotta be built on the, t uh, the, on the Tacoma platform, which is being built at Fremont, California, the old GM plant up in the Bay Area. So he said, I want you to come with me. We'll go tour that factory. Then we'll go to Brazil and we can tour that factory. We'll sit down with the president of Toyota Brazil because they had never met. There's so many arms to the octopus. And it was amazing. Under one roof in that factory, everything but long block, short block parts and glass, everything, casting, forging, stamping, ringing, pinion gear, steering box, everything was manufactured in one plant. So while my jaw, by the way, I'm not formally trained in anything. Uh, I have no degrees. I call myself an industrial designer now because I don't know what else to say and it's the easiest answer. And Raymond Lowy made up that term and you don't need a degree so I can't get in trouble. But I've just always followed my passion for design. I've always been a design and engineering geek. I'm always the guy who's like looking at the way things are made and kind of getting lost in the details. So that plant just blew my head. I'm at dinner with Mr. Toyota talking about that experience. He's at the completely opposite of the spectrum like, oh, it's shameful. I'm like, what do you mean shameful? He's like, oh, it's too, an so it was antiquated. So they were, they were like, oh no, this is like not good and we're glad no one outside of Brazil even knows like this exists, it's not Koshin, it's not ISO, it's ISNO, like it's, it's just, but, but from a crafting base, it was a mind blower. So we imported, I went and bought a bunch of Tacomas from the plant the way I wanted them. I air freighted in a bunch of bodies, basically like a crew cab 45, 43 and a 40. We took those into the shop. Toyota was incredibly cool. I think because I also was stupid cheap because I had no idea. I'd never done an OEM concept development work at that time. So I just told them what I'd tell any client. I was just happy to have the job and it was fun because I like to travel. I get to go to Brazil and I get to hang out with Mr. Toyota. And we got a motorcade because there were so many um, banditos that uh, like to kidnap high-powered executives, so it was kind of fun blowing through Sao Paulo in a motorcade, all armored cars. So tons of memories, but Toyota stayed completely out of our kitchen. They gave me a five-month build schedule to build the first unit. I had to use Toyota color palettes, Toyota textiles, and a taco as the foundation. 
I gave them a very brief design mandate of what they were going to get. They're like, great, fine, go. And we were ahead of schedule because I was literally working probably 70, yeah, 70 hour weeks with, uh, yeah, five of us were rolling 70 hour weeks and pulling favors with any sublet supplier because we just were so excited to see it done. So we called them and said, well, come take it for a test drive. It's done. The, wait, test drive? I'm like, yeah. Well, no, it doesn't have to drive. I'm like, what? They're like, no, just for concept. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. No, this is like, this is analyze and weight balance is killer. The ABS works. Like, everything's cool. The only thing I couldn't do were the airbags. So I, before we had 3D printers, so we like made little gel mold polymers and put SRS inserts into the steering wheels and into the dash pad. And like, so they were like, really? So word got back to Mr. Toyota. So instead of the babysitters coming to visit, he just showed up like, what the? So we took him out for a drive. He was totally into it. So he's like, would you do me a personal favor? Anything. Because I learned enough about Japanese culture at that point. If a Japanese person asks you to do them a personal favor, do it if you can, because the respect and merit in that culture is such that that is of the highest value. Could you build two more of them in the same time frame that you have remaining for the first one? Uh, yeah, sure we can. So then we built the crew cab and we built the 43. Toyota took them. Forget what show it was. It may have been, did you ever hear that story? Was, was it the Chicago? Or I think it was Detroit. It was a Detroit auto show. So they, first of all, they took those three prototypes, and then they go to Calti, which is um, Southern Cal design studio for Toyota. Anyone in Calti came out of the art center where I, I speak and in, in, in work with the school. It's one of the best design schools in the world. With no disrespect to them, though, they're creating people that will comply into clear-cut silos that will then funnel into cubicles to be compliant with corporate structures. And like this amazing designer, they'll try and almost train his personal perspective out so he's a compliant cog in the machine. And he'll do armrests until he jumps off the building one day or quits to do something more exciting. And the armrest dude will never meet the door panel dude, who will never meet the sun visor dude. So there's this disconnect, therefore there's not as much continuity, and in turn, therefore, personality in, in what they end up creating. So in the old days, for better or worse, transportation design was about differentiation, where even take, uh, take Mopar. So DeSoto, Chrysler, Dodge, Plymouth, it was all the same company. It was the same suits. They'd often share platforms. But they did have the guts to let one lead designer say what that brand is going to stand for and what it's going to represent, what's important to it. Thereby, that individual's unique perspective made that vehicle unique to its Plymouth brother or its DeSoto brother. Then perversions of Wall Street disposability, platform sharing, smarter business intellect at the cost of design and longevity. Now we end up with, I mean, you go outside and look at a black sedan, take the emblems off it. Basically, you took a, every new black four-door sedan, put it in a big white warehouse, invited the general public in, give them a scorecard and say what's what without the absurdly large grills and logos. Everything's so reactive to everything else, we'd all get a failing grade, I think. So everyone's copying everyone else. There's this disconnect, which has turned out to be a really good thing for us. But I find it frustrating because we're seeing it, right? Even in high production commoditized goods, there is starting to be differentiation in design language and mavericks that are getting success in the market. But transportation seems so slow to like, they're still thinking we're well, next year we're going to sell more units. Well, that's not the case with automation, with ride share, with community ownership, with better infrastructure, with urban development going the direction it's going, with autonomous vehicles. 
You're not going to be able to stand up at that shareholder meeting in a year even, or two years, and try and tell us they're going to make more next year. Those business models are going to collapse, I think, unless they rethink the core integrity of the product, creating a greater loyalty with the consumer. Until they figure it out, I'm able to build a business, albeit a small one, by being the lunatic that focuses on what we think is the optimum of what it can be, only with the support of people that are crazy enough to fund my stupid ideas. Which started with after those prototypes for Toyota, okay? They go, I didn't plan this, if you can tell, because I'm all over the place. That's just how I am. But at least you won't fall asleep, hopefully. So Toyota takes the three prototypes. We complete them on budget, ahead of time. They go to Calti. The Toyota board votes between the three, picks the target. The target goes to the Calti team. They tell the Calti team some kind of sort of referencing this. They had me do off-road trips with Toyota execs, Toyota marketing and designers, try and reconnect them with Earth so they understood why people buy four-wheel drives. And then the FJ Cruiser grew from that. I stayed on in, in design with the FJ Cruiser, but by the end of it, I think they wanted to kill me. And they would have fired me if they were paying me at that point, because I, I wouldn't shut up about a solid axle. I wouldn't shut up about it needed to be a convertible. I wouldn't shut up about the, at least the rear windows need to roll down so it's not a tomb. So the, I think all I can end up taking credit for in the production vehicle is the speedometer design, the triple wipers, from which I referenced the early military land cruisers from the Mideast. I always thought that was kind of a nifty thing. And the white uh, grill bezel. And that's about it. But Mr. Toyota said, I really appreciate you coming through with me on that. If there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. I said, well, you know, actually there is. For my research, I need to be vetted and allowed into the Toyota Tusho group to be able to buy directly from global Toyota entities and gain access. Okay. Okay, okay, like that's it, like no deeper, no, that was it. Oh, cool. So I get the access and they're like, Anyone I talk to at any corporate division was like, who is this guy? Who gave him my name? How do you get my number? Why do we have to? He wants what? And I started importing 40-foot cargo container loads of Bandarante body parts. Like again and again and again and again and again. And it was hell. Anyone ever done business in South America? Like Brazil? Amazing people, beautiful women, amazing music and meat. Do not try and do business there. The, there's actually, uh, in that culture, there's a, a, a job title called a despachante. So a despachante is the greaser. And he's respected more than the lawyers, the judges, the doctors. Because even if you need your driver's license renewed, you either stand in line with the general populace for 10 hours to get your driver's license, or you call your despachante, and two hours later he comes with your license, obligado, and you're done. So my containers were getting held hostage, basically, at the port. They were getting robbed of anything small enough to carry away. They were getting embargoed and be like, oh, we're so sorry, the, the wood you are using is not legal for export. But my brother, he has a crating company. And there, I was just hemorrhaging money. And all my stuff was getting stolen. So five container loads in. I figure out the politics in Brazil. We're using these parts only to complement our FJ Restos with TLC. And it was also at that point I was responding to people wanting V8s or different things, more modern performance in the powertrain. And I'd also lobbied Toyota's marine division so I could get the iForce V8s, because that's all I want. I don't want to put a Chevy in a Toyota. They gave me access to those. I go to pick up my first 24 units with standalone ECUs. You would have freaked out. 
full turnkey crate ready to rock I forces. President of TRD, where they were housing him at the time, good guy. Jonathan, I got bad news. They just shut down Toyota Marine, and Toyota Legal got involved because of that closeout. So uh, these aren't your motors, I'm sorry. They took hammer drills and sledgehammers and destroyed them all. There were 300 of them in the warehouse. Destroyed them all and threw them in the recycling bin because they didn't want the liability. So there went me using I-Force V8s. To this day, Toyota cannot get their head around a crate engine program, not to mention the ECU and electronic supports and physical adapters that are needed. But I get a lot of crap for putting LSs in, so that's the backstory of why that happens. But we're starting to tweak and do these variants, and we noticed there were even more people coming to TLC because crew cabs, long wheelbases, V8s, AC that actually worked, more precise steering. We were starting to play with coil suspension. Then Toyota destroys the plant in Sao Paulo because they were ashamed of it the whole time. So they blew it down and they, what are they building, like Yaris's or something, like total robot plant and all these people lost their job. And all these parts, I was so excited that opened up this whole new opportunity for me. And as a designer, I was starting to really geek out on all the new probabilities we could engineer. And within 24 hours, all of that done. So in fact, Greg has my last body, which you guys will see over near where the kid racetrack is. That's how we were buying them from Toyota. Glass and weather strip and dash pads, primered, fully assembled. <laughs> it was so sad. Then I try reconnecting with Mr. Toyota to buy all the tooling. They had already destroyed it. They melted down all the tooling. And that was the end of the Banderante and what seemed like the end of the whole idea that was soon to become Icon. But I have this, I'm weird. Like, things will get in my head and if they stay there long enough, probably any of you who build your own trucks, you have the same perversion where you start to see it almost as a real 3D rotatable entity. And if you can't get it out of your head, you're going to lose your remaining sanity, right? So that's where I'd gotten with this idea. So I'm like, all right, I can't get those bodies, but there's this guy in Canada I know that's making bodies, and I, I could get this, I could get that, I could try that, I want to use this. So the first step for Icon was just me in a feeble effort of preserving my percentage of sanity. And it was me and one key employee nights and weekends, and I just built it because I just had to see it. And when it was done, it's like, this could work. Like, this is different. I had to create a slightly different aesthetic. Does everyone know Icon or enough people? So, like, we had to be careful in that we, we wanted it to look different enough. That it wasn't trying to be different, but you went, wait a minute. Why does that look different? Because the whole theology and the engineering underneath it was so different that we really wanted, in the marketing message, to be able to communicate that. But I went back on my little hand-done spreadsheet, and I added it up, and what it cost to build. And then, OK, how, how many hours? OK. And then labor rate at the time. OK, OK. And then grand total. Oh, shit. <laughs> no one's going to buy this. This is not going to happen. So I was deflated. And I was like, well, it doesn't have to be Teflon coated aluminum. I guess it could be fiberglass. Ew. doesn't have to be that. It could be drum brakes in the rear. No. It could be, and it's like all these things I could do to cut costs. The whole point of me in, in, in doing what I was trying to do was to not be that and if I did that, I was just another one of those. And I knew I'd burn out and lose interest. And then I'd suck at it and probably become a bitter jerk. So I was talking to a friend of mine who's like a, a business legend. And he's always been like my one-man board of directors, this guy named Mickey Drexler, who comes from the Schmata world, like Gap, Banana Republic, and apparel. But it's one of those people, like he trusts his gut. 
he sees something and immediately it's hell yeah or F no. Like it's instinctual, it's guttural, and he trusts it. He was in town, he came to visit. I showed him the prototype, explained what I'm up to, what I'm struggling. I'm like, yeah, but it's too much. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Shut up. Shut up and build it. If you build it, they will come because you're passionate and you're honest in why you're doing it, and it'll read in the product. If you start trying to change it to do what you think they want or will tolerate, then you're just another schmuck. So I did. I, I took a, I got a small business affairs loan. I rolled the dice again because I've rolled the dice my whole life, and mostly it hasn't screwed me over. And we just sat at it. We got lucky because right before it was done, Toyota was pretty much done with the FJ. It was still the PX something was the prototype. And they did the show, I think it was Detroit. They brought my three protos I had built for them, and they bought their production prototype. There's VIP and press day, then public. By the end of VIP day, Toyota Corporate said, get those out of here. So Toyota contacted Toyota and said, listen, I know you're excited for these to be shown to the public, and it's just not going to happen. We don't want to show them what we're not going to build and they want. It's like, okay, well, that's good news and bad news because I've been doing it the way I knew you guys weren't going to do it because of my involvement. And again, pure luck, we finished the production first Icon unit right as Toyota was launching the FJ Cruiser. So then Toyota would invite us to events to be like the sideshow. And then the media, they're going to do the big story, of course, on Toyota. And then we'd, be, we'd get a little like sidebar. And then these geeks are doing these, you know, and they were involved in this. And boom, it just launched us. And it's just been Mr. Toad's wild ride ever since. And we've just been trying to keep up. And now Icon is much larger than TLC, maybe due to some light neglect on my half, because um, I've built a really good master alliance of key critical people with skill sets beyond my own. If this was just me, I would have screwed this up a long time ago and long been bankrupt, because I'm, I'm the tinker thinker. I'm never done. I do 99%. I'll struggle to deliver the last 1%, because to me, it's never, you can't relate to anything I'm saying, right? <laughs> Fellow craftsman Jeremiah. Um, so it's just taken like me being smart enough to be know I'm dumb enough to bring in a master alliance of people that can share my vision and build the brand. Thousands of FJs through TLC. The FJs through Icon were on uh, unit 196. We're on unit 90 with our Broncos. Unit 20 something with our Thrift Masters. We're about 30 some units in, these crazy one-offs we do, which are tons of fun, called the derelicts or the reformers. That's a whole nother rabbit hole. That's my current favorite rabbit hole. And just living the dream from all beginning with following my appreciation for the FJ40, like wholeheartedly. Why is that built that way? And being curious and diving into it and just kind of seizing opportunities. And I rec highly recommend everyone quit their responsible job. Follow your dream. Probably not a good time to get an FJ40 Resto with all these third world rust buckets coming in with lipstick on them, impact on the market. That's a whole nother. That would have been a fun conference. Anyway, um, I should probably shut up. I could rant forever, but I just wanted to share... Uh, my story and then open it up to questions because there's there's tons of stuff if anyone's curious I'm happy to uh, yak on further yeah so when we first launched the FJ series icons we just did the FJ 40 and I always loved the 45s, and since we only got them 63 to 67, it was a no-brainer to start doing those as well. But it was all about the 40 and the 45. Then I was doing the 43 by just stretching a 40. Not like Toyota, though. They, 
stretched it the cheapest way, where from my perspective in low volume, it was cost trivial, so I kept the departure angle and stretched it midship versus elongating the butt. But we were still hand to mouth, payroll to payroll to payroll, and I had this guy, I could tell he was ready to rock, but his wife was part of like everybody, right? Part of the buying decision as a family. And she said, no, 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 no. If you can't take all three boys with you and get the hell out of the house and give me some peace on the weekends in this thing, then no. And then, yeah, no, that's not, no. Only if they had a four-door. And I'm like, yeah, I know we don't have a four-door. And I knew I was losing the sale. And literally, while I'm on with the guy, I'm doing like a South Park quality Photoshop cut and paste, stretch, insert, swatch, match, patch, tool, boom. Check your inbox. What about something like this? And the wife's like, yes, perfect. He's like, well, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's a FJ44. And uh, yeah, I've been thinking about building those. And so then we used his money to develop the prototype and get the tooling on all the CAD out of the way. Now it's our number one seller. And it, it literally, it was as organic as trying to meet payroll, having it in my head, wanting to get it out of my head, telling that this was the guy who might say yes, or whose wife might say yes. And they're great, though. We cheat because the long wheelbase, coil suspension over leaf spring any day, obviously any 80 series owner knows that. But the wheelbase was a big cheat, and the fact that they can fit six they're just, just, just you're going to make that many more memories. You can take that many more people and do that much more. Unless you're going up like a creek bed and then you're screwed because it's like a 20-point turn. <laughs> Whereas the 40, you just goose it and pirouette and, and party on. Huh? That's Greg's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was impatient. He wouldn't wait for me to build him one. But once I had a really good used one come in, then he was ready to rock. That happens to us a lot. No one wants to wait. We don't have any inventory because every time I try and scale operations to get that modern wealthy consumer, because our price point's stupid. They're, they started about 195 grand. That's just the reality of building things in America, not to mention in Southern California. And the, I mean, if you look underneath it, and every, every widget is unnecessarily of high quality, and everything's machined if it can be instead of plastic and stuff but um yeah just all the all the details and i thought i was going to have to trim that back but my friend mickey turns out was right way smarter than me because the customer base that was able to afford a hundred and ten thousand dollar icon when we started not me it's them that have pushed or enabled me to keep geeking out and go to the brembo breaks go to the better this, to the forged that, to manufacture our own consoles and our own bumpers, and really enabled us to continue that ethic versus have to keep chipping away at it. Probably won't. It probably will in markets where the terrain, the socioeconomic factors, and the politics allow for it to. You know, you could argue there are plenty of very competent modern Toyota platforms that still speak to those ethics, right? They're just not here because this is more. 
Wall Street, disposability, repeat consumer focused and culturally we've allowed that to happen. That's the reality of the quality, I think. I mean, when it, when, if, if I go look at whatever, a new Porsche GT3, and that's killer, from my world of manufacturing and low volume and craftsmanship, that's only 200 and whatever thousand. Like, how can they do that that cheap? Is my weird perspective, right? Versus most consumers, like, you know, the, that's asinine. I've long felt and would love to be a part of, like, to me, Willis, most people think it's Willie's, but it's Willis, Will, Willie's Overland. Man, that is a brand today. What, what did it stand for? Simplicity, durability, longevity. So like if Toyota could do a Scion play based on even like take a Hilux and keep all your information technology touch screen crap that's going to go to hell in five years and cost more than the value of the entire vehicle, just keep it out of it. Give me a phone dock that the dealer will support is my phone or my iPad or whatever pad is that evolves. Give me a, a low cost insert that's submodular. Let all the tech ride on that. My phone does better navigation than any Toyota, any Porsche, anything in any car, any way, anyhow. Get rid of all that crap. Get rid of all the content related to it. Go back to the money being spent and the longevity and the integrity like an 80 series platform or the 70s. Decontent all that crap. And I think there is a consumer base who, okay, maybe 60 grand, but I mean, even a Ford pickup truck now, if you go to a Ford dealership and click all the boxes, you know you can leave the dealership with a $140,000 Ford pickup. So I'd argue in the 60 to 80K market, they could definitely make a business case for decontented, longer lasting, and in turn create a tribal consumer, which they're losing in droves today. Even Toyota Marketing, I consulted them for years because they were confused watching Land Rover kill it in North America with crap product by milk in the heritage language. JDM, TMC couldn't get their head around it. TMNA guys could. TMS guys kind of could. Talking about that, and Toyota wouldn't allow them to speak to that heritage. I'd argue. 10 years ago, if they had spoken to that heritage, and God forbid even shown a Land Cruiser in the way background in the commercials for the last two decades that they've made zero effort to present or represent the Cruiser in North America, they would be selling enough units to justify being our market, thereby would be able to justify a low content level. And fine, do a Range Rover golfer mall cruiser with the fridge consoles and the cooler seats and all those things those consumers want and charge them 120 or whatever they're used to paying in an autobiography this or that party on take their money but stick to the ethic that defined toyota in the world not to mention north america by by offering us that that integrity but you know arakawa who did the cruisers that we are also attached to earth movers 18 wheelers forklifts land cruisers so even back then, they were built to a different ethic, a higher standard, different standard, not fair. To, yes, higher. Let's say that is fair. And it was just over the years, and Toyota eventually bought Arakawa, turned it into Arako, and brought it into their main system and ethic, and sort of brought that down as much as they could get away with, whilst UNICEF, NATO, Gibraltar, Toyota, key markets, private militias, still have enough leverage in their buying power to say, no, no, we don't want, we don't care about the wood and the gather leather. We need this or we're going to go get a patrol because they're half your price point and they're a competent product. It's frustrating, isn't it? So the, oh, 
Oh, sorry. He was just asking about on my Instagram channel. I just posted the first project shot of a uh, 6.3 liter 70 Mercedes long wheelbase. Uh, not a Pullman, but just the standard 300 long project. So these one-offs we do, the derelicts, I'll take a car with epic patina of which there's several good examples here that I'd be more than happy to ruin. We'll laser scan it, we'll get it into CAD so I can re-engineer four-wheel independent suspension, Brembo brakes, rack and pinion, power steering, electric, gas, diesel, whatever the client wants or whatever. But we'll leave it looking like we did much of nothing and then hide the fact that it is a massively capable sleeper daily driver. So for that one, we engineered a one-off four-wheel independent chassis with a Dana 60 nodular third member, hydro-boosted six-piston Brembos all the way around, 700 horsepower dry sump blown LS9. But all this will be stuffed into what looks like your grandfather's work car, Benz, sleeper, heavy patina, uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to piss a lot of people off. It's super cool. So that car is six months in. Now that we have chassis, all the weird triangulation and bracing you saw was to maintain body rigidity because the inner fenders, wheel wells, trunk, and main floor were redesigning and recrafting. So that project I hope to have finished in about 10 months. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. We just at the Pebble Beach show debuted a 51 Hudson Super 6 Coupe. That is nasty. That one's really cool. As well as a 51 Pure Electric Mercury Coupe. That's super cool. Then we're doing a 70, I think it is a 70, C20 derelict long bed. That's the next one coming out the chute. And then after that is the Mercedes, a 48 Rolls-Royce James Young drop head, a early Volvo station wagon, which is going to be a killer sleeper, um, a 35 Auburn 653 Phaeton, and a super freak of a car designed by Gordon Burig, who did Duesenberg, like gorgeous, magical art deco. And then recently, I've been jonesing for an XJC, so the 70s two-door coupe version of the XJ6 Jag. So I might sneak in a personal build if I can find a good one. I want to build one of those. I just fell in love with those recently. They're a great greenhouse. All right. I appreciate everyone's time. You got a question? Yes, so the question was, did Toyota consider a removable top with the FJ Cruiser? The, my, my experience is hell yes, because every prototype I built had a removable top and removable doors and a folding windshield. Every meeting I went to, I stomped my fists and stamped my heels and insisted that if they don't do that, then don't do it. And uh, eventually, legal was concerned, which is a stupid answer, but in their defense, the first generation forerunner to this day is a legal liability for Toyota that does not go to court, has cut checks all day every day. They're worried about repeating that. Although the engineering and the stability control, all the answers were in place where that should have not scared them. And even the rear window was power until the last minute. And it saved like a couple pennies and a couple seconds in production. And then they got cut out. And that's when I lost my... Um, but there were follow-up plans of a Ford proper full Ford door. There were also plans for a convertible. There were many plans. Now what will be very interesting to see 
is what happens second quarter next year with the reissue of the Ford Bronco. So I'm quite curious. Uh, I'm on the design team with Ford on that one. And there have been a lot of similarities to the experience. But I think they're going to nail it. I'm feeling really good about it. For a while, it was going sideways. But I think it's going to be really cool. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then it's weird too, like even at Ford, it's like NDAs like that at Ford, but um, they look at Jeep because it's something from which there is tons of data. They can create a reference chart, a sales track, this and that, and they can create targets. And oh, well, they have 59 cubic capacities, so we we all have 61. Uh, they did this and that, without again the huevos to re, to respect the heritage value enough to say no. If we stick to the original ethic of that platform in a modern context, it can be different. It can do its thing, but it doesn't have to be reacting to something else in the market that they can be at a shareholder meeting or board meeting and justify their decision with historic successes of somebody else. And that's killing design. All right, everyone go pee. I'll shut up now. Thanks. All right, that was... Uh Every bit as insightful as we all anticipated. So uh, one more round of applause for Jonathan. Thanks for coming out. So I, kn I know we've all been sitting here a long time, but we have among us, uh, we have former sheriff Scott McKenzie, Butte County, oh. California. Uh, the, the gentleman that donated the, the burned up FJ40 that we've seen on display. Um, while we're all gathered, if you could just maybe take five minutes and, and share the story of that. Everybody's bladders are full, so let's not push it too much. It's good you beat me to that truck, or I would have turned it into an icon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be a cool look. Yeah, maybe. There's enough there. Inspiration for a future build. Yeah.